Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 168. You know, I was afraid I wasn't going to get this uh, episode done, and guess why? Because I've had a bit of a genealogical breakthrough. It's been on my maternal side, my in the German line of my family, and it has been absolutely incredible. You know, it's been a long time since I have had the luxury to really lose myself, you know, just get in that genealogy zone where hours just get devoured in what feels like seconds. And some very exciting things have been happening. So later in the show, I'm going to be sharing some of those developments and what I've learned from them. But first, there's been quite a bit of genealogy news since we last talked. Um, Just before I left for Los Angeles to speak at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree, I received an invitation to sit in on a conference call with the folks at Ancestry.com to hear about some very big upcoming news they were going to make. And if you read your Genealogy Gems email newsletter, then you now know too what this was all about. Ancestry announced they are going to be shutting down five areas of their business. Now in the media conference call uh, that I participated in, they gave us kind of a heads up that the next day they were going to make this announcement about the closures. And those of us that were on the call, you know, we had the opportunity to ask questions before the announcement was officially made. So while the spin is that, you know, they want to focus their efforts in, quote, a way that provides the most impact while also delivering the best service and best product experience to our users, it's clear that these are business decisions. And uh, these were businesses that were probably not very profitable. It makes good business sense probably to close them. And we certainly do want Ancestry to remain profitable so that it can remain in business. Obviously, we all benefit by, from all of that. But that doesn't mean that some of these uh, closures won't be painful for many of their customers. So there are five areas that they're shutting down. Um, Genealogy.com, which has been around a long time. Myfamily.com, which actually my uncle had set up a site and we've been, we have a little site on there and it's just been a way to uh, have your own little family history website. And my canvas, which is kind of their print on demand type publishing arm. It was a way for people to create a family history book or something, uh, you know, charts and things based on the information that they're finding at Ancestry. They're also shutting down uh, the Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA tests from Legacy DNA. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then they're also closing the English version of Mundia which frankly, I know very little about. (laughs) But many of these basically were acquisitions that Ancestry made over the years. And, you know, there's a couple different reasons you might want to acquire a company, you might want to do it in order to kind of remove the competition, which I think in some of these, that was the case. And you're also possibly trying to bring a uh, set of tools, a set of products to the, to the company that you don't currently offer that's already kind of ready made and somebody else is doing it. And so you bring it on board and it may or may not fly with your customers. The, the interesting thing to me about some of these, like my canvas or, or my family is they, I don't know about you, but I never saw a whole lot of advertising about this. Uh, they're, they weren't, um, highly touted on the pot, on the, on the website. They, they didn't do much, you know, any advertising for them. So I always had the feeling that, yeah, they're out there. They've been acquired, but they really didn't have a lot of backing internally with ancestry.com. So sure enough, these closures did cause some pain with their customers. And I know that includes many of you that are listening right now. And in fact, I started receiving emails almost immediately that morning that Ancestry uh, went public with this information. And 
Many of you also posted uh, your comments on the Genealogy Gems fan page. It's on Facebook. You can like us over there at facebook.com slash genealogy gems. And I invited you to do that uh, in the newsletter article that I sent out uh, about a week or so ago. It was right after the announcement came out. Well, in that article in the newsletter, um, I told you that one of the most surprising moments in this conference call was that the ancestry executives on the call were asked by one of the folks in the media who were uh, participating, they were asked if the DNA samples that customers submitted, particularly those samples of deceased relatives, we're talking DNA samples that really cannot be collected again, if those could be returned so that perhaps they could uh, pursue further testing with a different company. Because as you can imagine, for the Y DNA, for the mitochondrial DNA, you might have gone to, you know, your great grandmother and gotten the mitochondrial DNA and she has since passed. And um, Ancestry is the only one holding that sample. Well, the answer was loud and clear. No, they are not returning samples to customers. And in fact, when they were pressed on that answer, thinking, well, maybe it's not quite that definitive, um, they said that they really hadn't even thought about whether there would be a way for customers perhaps to upgrade those tests and run them for uh, more markers before they actually get destroyed. Maybe have Ancestry do that because see the closing date for these uh, closures is September 5th of 2014. So, uh, and yeah, they made it really clear. The word was destroyed. The samples are going to be destroyed, period, full stop. Uh, that did not appear to be negotiable, uh, no matter <laughs> how much people have clamored about it. But it was interesting to me that they really hadn't thought about whether they were going to kind of put it out there. Hey, we definitely, you know, take advantage of doing some upgrades on your tests before all of this comes to an end. And leave it to genealogists, you know, the genealogists on the call, they asked the important questions. And uh, my hope is that Ancestry is going to take that question to heart and and uh, consider it before the closing date of September 5th, 2014. Now, I don't have any information on this, but here's the thing, folks. It's very possible that the destruction has already occurred or that it's happening. I haven't heard either way, but see, the thing that they're promising is that uh, you can download your results from the website up until September 5th of 2014. I don't think they're actively at this point taking any new customers, any new orders. And I don't even know that they're actively supporting the upgrade of markers. I think that was a very, oh, hadn't thought about that <laughs> kind of a question. And so it's possible. And I wish I could get somebody to confirm that uh, they've already started kind of clean, clean house, if you will, which is kind of a, a sad thought. So we'll have to wait and see if anybody comes forward with that. You can read more about, um, we can read the original blog post that they did on the Ancestry blog. I'll have that link in the show notes for you. And there's an area on that original post where they make the announcement where you can click through on each of the individual five businesses and read more um, Q&A about what's going on with my canvas, what's going on with genealogy.com, etc. And as I said, my impression on this call that I was on was that they were kind of caught off guard by the big pushback from those of us on the call regarding the DNA samples. Ancestry is very focused on profitability and you can't blame them for that because they're a business. And if they don't remain profitable, they go out of business. And again, we all lose. Now, it was easy for them to think through the profitability of Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. I've got some additional thoughts on that. But I don't think it was as easy as for them to think through the impact on everyday family historians, because to be honest, many of the top executives over at Ancestry, and I've met several of them, they're very nice people, but they're not genealogists, um, not the way you probably are and your friends and, and other people in the community. They're not actively genealogists, they are actively executives in a large company. So first, I want to kind of springboard from this, and I want to share with you some of the comments that I've received from many of you. 
And also want to check in with a DNA expert who has some thoughts to share. And finally, I will share my own personal opinions on this. Um, I'm devoting a lot of time up front in this episode because this has definitely been kind of a bit of a firestorm. And I want to um, make sure we're having a conversation about it here so we can kind of think through our options and, and also what we can learn from this whole situation. Now, first, I got an email from Graham in Australia. And he writes, uh, this morning, I found the following Ancestry DNA announcement in my email and felt the need to immediately respond. No sooner had I sent my response and your newsletter arrived on this very subject. I thought you might be interested in my response, uh, as I'm sure that there will be many people out there who will be similarly betrayed. I paid out some $250 in 2009 to have my Y DNA test done with them, knowing that this was going to be a long-term investment to possibly find matches. So here's what Graham wrote to Ancestry. I'm disgusted that Ancestry is taking this action. You appear to only be after short-term gains rather than the long-term, which is where the strength of DNA testing resides. In 2009, I invested in my Y DNA test, knowing that this will likely take several years to yield useful paternal match results, which was the main thrust behind doing the tests. I don't know who is my biological paternal grandfather, and through the matching facility that I've been in contact with, the closest person yet, and while quite distant, it has given me some direction and hope that a match can be found in the future. Your action to remove this has just killed that possibility. I, for one, will not be considering taking any autosomal tests, which, by the way, is is the test that Ancestry is moving forward with. And he says that I won't be taking any autosomal test with you, as this will likely be dumped sometime in the near future. And I think Graham makes a point there. It's hard to to, to uh, watch Ancestry kind of go forward and push this autosomal test as like the go-to test when they've just lost a lot of confidence with a lot of their customers, because we all thought the go-to tests originally were Y-DNA and mitochondrial, and certainly they're not obsolete. Um, But autosomal is the new hot babe in town. And um, and then the question becomes, do you invest your time, your money, and your efforts into doing that test with Ancestry when they have a track record now of dumping DNA samples and giving up on particular tests. Nobody can see the future, that's for sure. And DNA, we're in the early pioneer days of this. So a lot can change. So I guess he makes a good point there. Roxanne in Oregon writes, I am very upset with Ancestry.com and their comments about not returning DNA, the Y and mitochondrial samples, or giving the opportunity to upgrade the test. Could this be just the beginning? I understand about business, but their policy of, in quotes, destruction is not acceptable. This seems to violate a code of ethics that we have all come to rely on when giving samples to further science as well as our own research. Who knows what the future will hold after we are all gone? Surely our DNA samples will become more helpful as testing becomes more acute. At the very least, examples should be able to be transferred to another DNA lab, even if one needs to pay for it. Who can we write letters to at Ancestry.com and at what address? Maybe if they get enough responses, the policy of destruction will be reanalyzed. Well, Roxanne, as I mentioned, in the original blog post that I'll have a link for in the show notes, um, you can click through on the Legacy DNA link and there's more information there. And I'll suggest leave comments on their blog. They are reading them. They're monitoring them. As I said, nobody's come out and said whether this destruction has already occurred or is occurring. So we may not get, I don't know, a direct answer on that, or even if it's possible. But I do know that the blog comments are being read and monitored, and that's the place to uh, make your comments. Um, and then what happened was, so these emails are coming in, and Ancestry kind of comes out with a new posting. They see the firestorm is erupting. And so Ken Shaheen, I think that's how you say his last name, on June 12th of 2014, uh, on the Ancestry DNA blog, I think it's, it's a separate blog, but it was cross post on uh, the Ancestry blog. He wrote, as many of you know, we announced last week that we're retiring our Y-DNA and mitochondrial test. Unfortunately, we didn't explain clearly our rationale for our decision, which has led to confusion. We'd like to take this opportunity to share the thinking that we, that went into our decision making process. 
First, we'd like to clarify that we are not retiring our autosomal ancestry DNA test that we launched in May of 2012. We're only retiring Y DNA and mitochondrial tests. Okay, I just have to put in my own opinion here. I didn't read anybody who was confused about that. <laughs> I just have to say, I don't know, I kind of read like a political statement. I mean, you know, nobody was out there saying, oh my gosh, autosomal's going away. We all get it. It's Y DNA and mitochondrial. So that's my little opinion. Take it for what it's worth. Uh, he says, while the Y DNA and mitochondrial tests launched genetic genealogy and led to many great discoveries, the autosomal test has opened even more possibilities for family history research. Therefore, our decision to retire the Y DNA and mitochondrial tests is a deliberate attempt to focus our resources on providing powerful family history research tools that use autosomal testing. Second, as part of the decision to retire Y DNA mitochondrial tests, we were faced with another difficult decision on what to do with the customer samples. On the one hand, we understand the value of these samples to many of you. On the other hand, we take customer privacy seriously and regrettably the legal framework used to collect these samples does not allow us to retest or transfer those samples. Practically speaking, many of these samples are also no longer usable. For example, many of the swabs were exhausted of genetic material during our testing, or the sample may be past its shelf life. In the end, we made the difficult decision to destroy the samples and are committed to trying to find solutions to these roadblocks for future products. And I'll stop there and just say, I think that's your answer. It, I think it's already been done. Ah. <sighs> I know. I hear you all sighing out there. He might not quite mean that, but I think that's exactly what he's saying. I think it's already been done. Okay. The rest of the um, blog post says, we understand that many of you have spent years using the Y-DNA and mitochondrial products for genealogy, and no amount of justification will offer you comfort in our decision. It is our hope that our future products will convince you that the autosomal test is a powerful and useful tool for family history. And I think he's right. The autosomal test is a powerful tool, but I don't think that that means that Y DNA and mitochondrial is not relevant. The truth is, and I think the key was he said, we've decided to focus our resources on this hot new test, not taking anything away from autosomal, but I'm just saying, I hope that people out there aren't getting the impression that Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA is no longer worth doing. There are different tests. We're going to talk about that even more in the weeks and episodes to come. They are different tests. They are just deciding to focus on this particular product, which is the autosomal test, which they can certainly do. But I just want to clarify that because it's not an either or. Okay. So there were comments, as you can imagine, people are leaving their comments on the Ancestry blog. And I encourage you, to be heard, that's the place to do it, um, to be heard by Ancestry. I'm glad that you're writing me as well, because we're having this conversation here. We, you know, you guys, family, and this is part of our community, and this is our genealogy community. So I think it's important that we have this conversation together here at Genealogy Gems. But I think it's also important uh, to do as these next folks did, which is uh, posting your comments over at the Ancestry blog to make sure that they're reading it as well. I pulled out a couple of comments that I thought were really valid and important. Judy commented, also, did anyone else notice that they mentioned that many of the samples are past shelf life? How does family tree DNA guarantee 25 years of maintaining our samples? That's where I've done testing and I will do more with them. I don't trust Ancestry for testing, especially now. I have to ask our DNA expert who I will be introducing you to later in this show, because that's an incredible point. If another company is saying, Hey, we're going to guarantee, you know, guarantee this for 25 years uh, and maintain these samples. Yikes makes the shelf life argument sound again, a bit of like a politician, but <laughs> I don't know. There may be something else to it. I'm not an expert on that, but we'll, we'll explore that further. Adriana says, what I'm a little less clear on is why you're just deleting the results off the website. Good point. She says, can't you simply archive them so that they'll be viewable? 
Does it really take that much effort or bandwidth to simply let me see my mitochondrial haplogroup? Excellent point. And I have not seen a response from Ancestry on that yet. Mitch says, but I have to question how committed you are to my research when you delete a valuable tool that I paid you for. All right, well, at this point, let's take a break so we can hear from one of the wonderful sponsors that helps make this free podcast possible. And then we will come on back and continue on with our conversation about the closures at Ancestry. I've got some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available, and it offers some of the most customer-requested features, like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages, plus dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to rootsmagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Now, as I mentioned, I did talk about this on the newsletter and invited all of you to go over to the fan uh, page for Genealogy Gems to leave your comments. And Susan did just that. She says, Ancestry.com should not destroy the DNA, exclamation point, especially for persons now deceased. They should make every effort to return samples if people ask for them by a specific date. I guess they're thinking about liability issues and bogus requests, but I'm sure they can figure out a way to ascertain that the person asking is related to the DNA. If you get into this related to the DNA thing, I guess my opinion on that is, is that that sounds like a, you know, a way to eat up a lot of time and resources. But it would seem pretty logical that if they had wanted to return DNA, that certainly the person who submitted it would be the logical person to return it to. And as you know, many of us do submit DNA samples for people in our family. Some of those people have already passed because we were the one orchestrating things and we had their permission to do so. So um, that seems like it would have been logical. But as I say, I think they're already gone. Uh, Tom is one of the administrators over at a Facebook fan page. It's called Google Earth for Genealogy, and I'm an administrator there as well. We all get together and talk about uh, Google Earth. And he alerted me to the fact that they have put together kind of a campaign to um, try to get a petition started. Um, he writes here, have you seen our Facebook page and online petition to persuade Ancestry.com not to destroy their Y DNA and mitochondrial samples and data? I'm not sure where you stand on this. Well, you're hearing it now, Tom, but we're off to a good start. Our Facebook fan page has about 280 likes, but our online petition is doing even better with over 730 signatures. He asked if I would share it with you here on the show. So I want to let you know, I will have a link in the show notes for this petition. And as I say, I'm not sure that it will make a huge difference, but I do think there's nothing wrong with putting your voice out there or putting your signature out there and at least uh, letting them know, hey, we're paying attention. And, it, you know, it may not solve the situation with this particular case, but I think it will get people's attention and get them thinking even more about future things they do that impact the customers. It certainly seems like if they had brought, and I don't know, maybe they did, but if they brought more customers into the, the question, they would have at least maybe anticipated some of this concern. See here. So it's oh, the Facebook page that Tom is talking about is called stop ancestry.com's DNA dump. <laughs> it's an online petition on the change.org website. So what I have here is facebook.com slash no as an N O D N A dump. Okay. So you guys can head over there. So 
Now, I've interjected some of my own opinion on this, but uh, Tom was asking my opinion for this as well. And I want to share with you, these are my personal, personal thoughts about this. I think it's a big mistake not to offer alternatives to their customers for retention of the samples. I think they just missed the boat on that. Um, and some of the commenters have mentioned that it wouldn't have been so hard. You know, how much bandwidth could it take to just leave at least the results up on the website? I think they should have done that. And I think also that returning samples or giving people a window of time to request the return of a sample to the person who submitted it at the first place would have made sense too. The thing is that costs money. And I know I hear you folks. We paid money. They should be spending a little bit of money to make that possible. But they could have also said, hey, for $10, we'll return this back to you and then you can go forward. Or at a minimum, offer a three-month window to allow people to run additional markers or upgrade their tests before it all happened. So there were alternatives there. However, I always, and don't think I'm not sympathetic. I am sympathetic to this entire dilemma, but uh, I didn't do my original testing with Ancestry, just so you know. I did it with some other companies. Um, I always preach to all of you, if you've been listening for a while, then you know that I recommend that you retain control of all that is important to you and that you are responsible for your own genealogy. Okay. We got to be responsible and not just put it in somebody else's hands. You know, ancestry is not our daddy. <laughs> and when you test, particularly an older relative, if, if this really matters and I get it, we are, as I said, in the pioneer days of DNA, who could have possibly anticipated how quickly things would change, how quickly it would move. All of a sudden, you know, autosomal is the new hot test. I, I understand that. And, and honestly, what I'm about to suggest, I didn't even do this myself, but what I would say we can learn from this is one of the ways that we can retain responsibility is that we should save a sample in our own lockbox at home if it really matters to us before we send an, a sample to a company. I don't care whether it's ancestor or family tree DNA. I mean, uh, a hurricane could take out family tree DNA's, you know, testing facility and that would be done. So just like with historic photographs, and I've been working with some of mine here. Um, <laughs> that's part of my big project I've been working on scanning these and they are one of a kind. They are in the original green velvet album that came across the Atlantic Ocean with my great grandmother. And I mean, they are irreplaceable. I could kick myself. I've waited so long before I did really high quality scans of each individual picture, the front and the back. Now that's because I, you know, I just moved to Texas. We're in tornado alley. I could be wiped out tomorrow and that book would be gone. Now it's safe. It's on my computer and it's backed up with carbonate. Okay. <laughs> but, um, why would it be any different with DNA? Than it would be with a precious photograph of, of grandmother. What if you have grandmother's DNA? Um, we need to apply this kind of thinking to everything that we do in all areas of our research, anything that matters to us. Uh, even if it's an object that, that cannot be duplicated or replaced, take a picture of it, document where did it come from? Who did it come from? Take it from different angles. Even if you lose the object, you have a record of it. Okay, so I would say what we have all learned is that we need to take double samples and save them for ourselves. If you have already uh, done sampling or testing with another company, you know, you might want to do this. <laughs> do your backup now with your DNA test. So it's, it's just like I'm always recommending to all of you. Never use Ancestry as your one and only tree. That's another example. When you post your family tree online, hey, that's great. It's a great way to connect with other people, but you retain the master on your database, on your computer, and then you back it up to the cloud or to another hard drive kept somewhere else. Like if I were to back it up to a hard drive, I would not keep it in a box here at my house in Texas because if the tornado comes through, then I lose it all anyway. I back it up to an online service. So that's the idea, whether it's your tree, you know, we don't use online services. I don't care how long they say they're going to be around. Nothing's forever. 
The only thing that's forever is our family and our descendants. And we want to make sure that we take charge and we take control of every piece. So think through everything that you've been using and working with in your family history. Have you backed it up? Have you duplicated it? Have you retained control or have you handed it off to somebody? It's like, I can't even stand using those services where you put your precious VHS tapes in a box and ship them off to somebody. And I'm going to take them into a store and stand over them (laughs) while they make copies because that's all I have. So it sounds great, but you know, nobody is going to make, uh, can make a promise of permanence or a promise of forever. As we can see, companies come and go and websites come and go. And there's a lot of different motivations for why they do so. I've said this before, but you've noticed there's a lot of genealogy companies of all different types popping up with websites. You don't hear about them all here on Genealogy Gems. And in fact, (laughs) some people might say, oh, gosh, Lisa sounds like a Pollyanna. No, I just talk about stuff I like, things that I think are worth your time and effort. So I don't tend to get more on the critical side because I just don't mess and waste my time with I do my evaluation. If I don't think it's worthwhile or they're not going to be around for a while, I'm not going to talk about it here on the show. So, but the idea is, is that some of these companies are Truly, their entire business plan is two years, start up, get going, get customers, and get bought, get acquired by Ancestry or another company. That's the plan. That's the cash out. (laughs) And again, it happens in all industries, and that's totally understandable, but we've got to not be naive. We have to understand that that's how business works. That's why the, the world continues to turn. And so that means we need to take responsibility. I know. Wait, hang on. I got to move my soapbox. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I've been up here. This is not, this is a little unusual for me, but I feel so strongly about it. And I think we can all be upset about what happened and everything, but boy, we need to learn from it and make sure that we don't let it happen to us again. Okay. Cause it's not everybody else's fault or everybody else's problem. I'm a firm believer on, Hey, as my mother used to say, life ain't fair, get over it. <laughs> and then take responsibility for yourself. Okay. I also want to say that I think that offering only an autosomal test, and I kind of mentioned this before, it's kind of a a trendy thing, rather than a true comprehensive product tool for the genealogist when it comes to DNA. In fact, I just published this last week, some brand new, excellent quick reference guides on DNA. The first ones we did, first one is getting started genetics for genealogists. And the other one is on the Y chromosome test. We are currently working on the autosomal and the mitochondrial. And I did it for this very reason. You can't just take their word for it. Oh, autosomal's awesome. Let's do that. Well, that might not be the right test for your genealogical question. And even if it is the right test, uh, Ancestry may not be the right company or family tree DNA might, might not be the right company. You have to know what they offer, what their tools are on their website and make an educated decision. And that's where a lot of people get messed up because it's very intimidating and it's not cheap. Maybe you spend a couple hundred dollars. You want to know you're getting the right test for the right question in your genealogy research with the right company who has the right tools and results information for you that you can work with. And so I've um, published, got found a fantastic DNA expert, worked with her. She's written this, these quick reference guides. I've been editing them. We've published them, uh, first time publishing another author under Genealogy Gems Publications. And I couldn't be more excited because to me, this really breaks it wide open. It means everybody can in plain English understand in these guides how this works and what the questions are and how to make an educated decision. So it's amazing that all this happened at this time because we've had this in the works for several months, um, feeling like there was kind of a need for it out there. I've been hearing from people who have questions about DNA and how do I pick? And how about this? The question of, I ran my test, now what? What am I supposed to do with it? (laughs) You know, I even ran up against that myself in running some DNA testing. So I think that these will really uh, answer those questions. And and, uh, again, those are already in the Genealogy Gem shop. We're going to talk with the author of those guides uh, in just a little while. But I just wanted to mention that 
that is something, again, trying to proactively say, what can we do to educate ourselves to make the right choice and to know there's more than just ancestry, there's more than just family tree DNA out there, and there's certainly more than just autosomal tests. So just because ancestry has made that choice doesn't mean that's our only choice. So this is all just my personal opinion. And in fact, it falls right into the another email I got from Linda. She says, I just purchased a DNA kit from Ancestry. Knowing now that they're just continuing that part of the program, can I send the samples anywhere else? What do you suggest? How do I get them done? And, and that's where these guides come into play. So again, they're called Getting Started Genetics for the Genealogist and the Y Chromosome DNA for the Genealogist. Those are two quick guides. They're in the store at genealogygems.com. And in fact, because we just launched them, they're actually a little bit discounted too. So this is a good time to grab them. Now, DNA was not the only question at hand. My canvas was another one. Randy wrote in from, from Seattle. He was very concerned about my canvas says, I just noticed that they're dropping the my canvas service. I could understand not wanting to invest a lot into trying to keep it up to date with other printing services. And there is a lot of competition out there. He's right. He says, however, they are not only dropping the service, they are doing it in less than three months. All the content will be deleted. There is no way to export the existing projects, and there is no alternative service to which all the work which has gone into existing projects can be transferred. He says, I am a longtime Ancestry.com member and a follower of your podcast and webpage. Generally, I defend Ancestry against a lot of the complaints that people have about them, but this is pretty disheartening news for me. I have put hundreds of hours into creating a number of Ancestry projects, and having a printed copy is not the same as having the electronic version available to update and get a new updated print. And he asked if I have any suggestions, uh, any alternatives, and indeed I do. And I think there again, uh, Randy has brought up a an incredible point about my canvas, which is, yes, almost unbelievably, you can't download your project. I'm guessing that's because they probably have a proprietary type of uh, software that you're using on their website to create your project. And that brings up a good lesson to learn from this, which is in evaluating a print on demand type service that you're going to use, asking the question up front, if I want to get this back, how do I get the, the stuff back? Is it all embedded in a software program that I can't use once you've gone away as a website or what? Now I use uh, the print on demand company, Lulu. It's lulu.com, L-U-L-U. It's Lulu Press. And Lulu does print on demand publishing. They're best known for books, which is where I started using them uh, printing our genealogy gems publications on my books. Um, but they do more than just books. They do photo books. They do calendars. They do all kinds of other types of projects, similar things to what my canvas did. But I do know, at least in the case of books, we do the initial work. I did mine in publisher and then export it as a PDF and upload it to, to Lulu. Now, Certainly for some of the photo books, they have specialized, you know, layouts. And that's where you get into some trouble about how to get exported back out. The only way to really get around that that I know of would be to lay it out yourself, export the finished file and upload that to get it printed. Probably more difficult. Most of us aren't designers, but I think that's what my canvas is facing is that they probably have a layout built into their software and there's just no way to put that back out and have it work on your own computer. And you know, this happened to me actually years ago, Kodak Gallery. In fact, I remember in a very early podcast episode, I talked about publishing my little, um, they were like, I call their photo books, but they were also had story in them as well. These hardcover, um, 20 page double sided books I did, and I did them with Kodak Gallery. Defunct. They're gone. Shutterfly is now out there. They're very popular, but these businesses do come and go. I would have actually thought that my canvas would have been a fairly secure place to do this because it's part of a bigger organization. They can weather some of the financial storms because you have a diversified portfolio, right? But not so much. Lulu has been around a very long time. They're big and this is all they do. So no promises, nothing is forever, but I would um, 
to say that I've had some great success with them and you might want to check them out as well. Catherine in Ohio also said she's going to miss my canvas. She says my heart sank when I received the email. Uh, the service was just what I wanted, easy to work with and prompt and provided a beautiful product. She asked if I knew of any other place to get charts printed. And yes, what I would recommend is a company I've talked about here on the show before, Family Chart Masters. You'll find them at familychartmasters.com. So, wow, kind of an unusual episode that the news dominated much of the conversation here, but I think it's important. And I think we've learned a lot as well from this news, even though something looks negative, you know, it's whenever the worst storm comes, there's always something to be learned. And that's the silver lining. Coming up next, I want to introduce you to that DNA expert I told you about. She has joined uh, as our Genealogy Gems DNA guide, and that's Diane Southard. And you're going to meet her coming up next. Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage. Now, I know that you tune in to the Genealogy Gems podcast because you know that I'm going to carefully vet the products that come across my desk. And I'm only going to bring to this show the ones that I really think are the real gems. Well, MyHeritage.com is in that category, and I couldn't be happier that they've signed on to support and sponsor this free podcast. I've spent the last several months really digging into my heritage, and I found some powerful tools that I think you really need in your genealogy tool belt. First of all, they have over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Get your tree posted on their website and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but genealogists around the world. Then there's MyHeritage's unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. It constantly calls 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It's also the first to translate names between languages. And I personally like that the matches from the historical newspaper collection at MyHeritage, they show up towards the top of the results list. So visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started. So there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. As you know, we can't all be experts in everything. And while I have a good basic understanding of DNA and have had some testing done in my own family, I'm no expert on DNA. And yet we see stories popping up. We have questions as we're doing some of our testing. And we really want to be able to try to make sense of it all. And so, well, I was at the uh, Florida Genealogical Society Conference. I had an opportunity just out of pure genealogical serendipity to have uh, my table where my books were right next to Diane Southard. And she is a DNA expert, and she was there speaking at the conference on DNA. And the more I heard her explaining to the different people coming by her booth what DNA was, how it can work within their genealogy, and more specifically, how they could figure out which tests to take and what to do with those results when they got them back, I realized she is the perfect guide for all of us to make our way through the 
trails of DNA, if you will. And so I've invited Diane to become a regular contributor here at Genealogy Gems. She's going to be our DNA guide to answer your questions, my questions, and to help guide us through the whole process so that it can become one of those integral tools that's part of our genealogy tool belt. So let me introduce you to Diane Southerd. Hi, Diane. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, I was just so thrilled to hear somebody in a nice, clear, concise, easy to understand way explain DNA. And anybody who can do that, person after person after person at a conference (laughs) knows her stuff. I love the fact that you can bring some clarity and kind of take, I think, some of the fear out of it, uh, because it's really difficult to embrace a tool that we just don't quite get. Um, What's your background? How in the world did you get into the area of DNA? You know, it started back in college. I I took a class, and it was actually an anthropology class, and my professor uh, on Fridays would go over some of the different um, professions that you could pursue in the area of anthropology, and one of them was forensic anthropology, and it was essentially digging up dead people and figuring out how they died. And I thought, that's awesome. That's what I want to do. Um, but I ended up transferring uh, universities, ended up at Brigham Young University, and they did not have a forensic anthropology program. And so I went into the microbiology building and I went to the desk and asked them what kinds of research were going on in their department. And the lady at the desk gave me a list and I looked down and there's pathogens and there's all sorts of things that I had zero interest in. And then there was the diamond of all research projects was a a professor by the name of Scott Woodward who was doing some research on ancient Egyptian mummies. And I thought, that is awesome. I want to be involved in that. And so I started volunteering in his laboratory and I was a microbiology major at the time and it was fascinating. We, we had these samples, um, ancient bone and teeth samples from these mummies buried in the depths of Egypt. And uh, it was just so fascinating. And that uh, research project turned into the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. And then after college, I started working for them and essentially was there until they were sold to Ancestry.com. And at that point, I went off on my own. And, you know, I think that's where our paths first crossed, because I think years ago, perhaps at a Family History Expo, did you ever go to the Family History Expo? All the time. I think so. I think you and I met, because I think you were with Sorensen way back then, and we had somebody from Sorensen here on the show at the time, and they did some pretty interesting things. They were really early pioneers in this whole area of bringing DNA to genealogists, And that's really become kind of your focus. What are you doing now in your professional career in terms of helping people with their DNA? Well, after working for Sorensen and for their subsidiaries, uh, it was very clear that people would come to a lecture or they would see a flyer or talk to a friend and get really excited about DNA testing, be convinced that this was definitely what they needed to do. So they would go ahead, they'd pay the money and they'd wait anxiously for their results. And then when they got them, they could not figure out what to do. Exactly. And it was so frustrating as an employee of one of these testing companies to to feel like we were not providing the value that was necessary to help people take the next step. They had done the testing, but they weren't able to convert it into answers and results. And so then I was like, okay, this is this is a field that needs attention. And so once I was essentially freed from my relationship with a testing company, I felt like I was able to really take on the responsibility of helping people understand what to do next. It's almost like um, getting a car customized and produced at some car company and it gets delivered to your house. They just don't give you the keys. Exactly. (laughs) How do you drive it? What in the world do you do with it? Yeah, I fully admit that we had um, some testing done of my uncle many years ago when DNA was kind of first hitting the, the genealogy scene. And the one thing I give myself credit for was I did sign up for a surname study, you know, where I could compare my tree with other people with their markers and try to make connections. But 
beyond that, I just didn't know quite what to do with it. And then what happens, I think, for many of us is that we go, okay, I'm going to sit down and see, you know, what are my options? And then all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of options, and they're all described differently. And there's, you know, papers out there that you can find online, but they kind of go over your head. And who really wants to stop all of their genealogy research to spend hours and hours, if not days and weeks, trying to learn and understand all of this. And what caught my attention was when I sat in on your class in Florida and you got partway through and you and you kind of looked at the audience, you said, okay, now this next piece I'm going to tell you, it's interesting, it applies to this, but if that doesn't interest you, just uh, close your eyes for a second, you know, take a break. <laughs> and you let people know what they could let go of and not worry about and, and what the key things were to listen to. There are areas of DNA where we don't need to know everything, right? Absolutely. Yes. Lots and lots. And and it's uh, like any new subject that you study. Like you said, there's it's not that the information isn't out there. I don't necessarily know secrets or proprietary information that I, I can't tell anybody but people who ask. It's not like that. Everything's out there for the taking. It's just I'm the filter. I can look at you and say, okay, this is what you need to know right now. And if you want to know more, I can tell you a lot more. But if you are going to glaze over and totally forget everything we've talked about, you've hit your limit, then let's stop. And, And I have only told you what you needed to know to move forward. Exactly. And that leads me to you and I getting together after the conference and sitting down and I said, wow, I need a cheat sheet on this and you're the person who knows it. And we needed something that would be something that people could pick up and literally walk through it. And this guide would, you would guide us within the guide. You would Mm -hmm. tell us, okay, let's do this first. Um, Let's talk about this getting started guide a little bit because it's you did an amazing job with it. It's very comprehensive and yet it's so easy to understand. What's your goal here? You know, I think my number one goal was to answer the basic questions that anybody who hears about DNA testing comes up against. They want to know what are the available tests for me and what are they going to tell me? And so we go over kind of each individual test type and what each of them can do. Probably my favorite part of the guide, which uh, was really something new that I'd never thought of doing before until I was on my five hour drive home from talking with you and I (laughs) had my phone out and Siri and I were making note after note about the things I I had thought of when I was talking with you. But on the back page of the guide is is a a step-by-step flow chart that teaches you exactly who to have tested and which test to take to answer your question that each DNA endeavor that you begin should begin with a question. Either you want to know about a particular ancestor, about their parents, or you want to know about that ancestor's ethnicity. Those are really the two main types of questions you can ask. And the guide helps you understand, okay, I have this question. Who do I have tested? Which test do I take? And where do I go from there? Exactly. And you know, what's so funny is this guide is so symbolic of the whole reason why we're doing this. Because when you when I first glanced at it, I thought, oh, that looks like a lot of stuff. (laughs) What am I going to do? And then I realized that's the the beauty of it is I don't need to understand the whole flowchart. What I needed to do was pick which question I wanted to answer. So you can do that. And then there are actually, even though there's lots of circles and, you know, uh, different shapes on here, I only have these three circles to look at, and I just need to pick one of them that fits. And then from there, it very quickly funnels it right down to the particular test, the particular company. And you start to realize we don't need the whole thing at one time. We just need a little piece of what we're trying to answer today, and yet we can keep coming back to this chart on the guide And as new questions come up, as new opportunities show up, we can go back to it and then follow the path to the next test or, you know, results we want to explore. So it's, it's beautiful and it's simple once we just take a deep breath and, and walk through it. You you also talk about, well, you've got the great quick guide glossary. So when we run across these terms and we feel like, "Uh oh, that just now I just stopped in my tracks because I don't know what junk DNA is. We can go and look at that. One of the things I know I asked you to to really look at in putting this together because it was really on my mind and on the minds of many of my listeners was privacy. 
and what can we expect? And t- talk a little bit about, as a user, what the experience is. And, you know, we're all a little concerned about privacy these days. Absolutely. And I think that if you're not concerned about privacy, then you should be because your DNA is a record of who you are and where you came from. But at the same token, uh, your DNA in many cases, especially in genetic genealogy, is not identifying you uniquely. It is identifying you as a member of a large group of people with shared ancestry. And there are very few kinds of DNA tests for genealogy that can actually identify you uniquely as a person. And I think a lot of the fear that comes is is because you don't understand these terms that are found in the glossary. And once you can understand exactly what the testing company is doing, what parts of your DNA they're looking at, then you'll realize that there isn't the danger that your insurance company or uh, your job or anything can get a hold of this information and use it against you. That really just is not the case. And in fact, there are some laws in place that have been formed specifically to protect your genetic rights. Yes, exactly. And that's what you definitely spell out uh, on the sheet, which I gave me a great deal of comfort. And it, it made me feel like, okay, I've done my due diligence. I understand what I'm getting into and what's not happening here. Um, you answer questions like, what can DNA do for your research? What can't it do? Which is, of course, as, as important, if not mm-hmm. more important. Who should be tested? Which company should we work with? What can we expect when we get it back? And what can we do next with it? And that takes me to the second guide, which is the Y chromosome DNA. So give us a real quick rundown. What are the different tests? And why did you start with this one first for the guides? So there's really three different kinds of test types. There's mitochondrial DNA for your direct maternal line. There's this Y chromosome DNA for your direct paternal line. And then this new customer called autosomal DNA that kind of covers everybody in between in a way. So mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA have been around the longest. Um, in fact, uh, when I first started with the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation, we were only testing Y and mitochondrial DNA and autosomal DNA was this dream of the future for, <laughs> for all of us. And uh, I think of the three test types, Y chromosome DNA is the most employed most easily employed by a genealogist to answer specific questions. So I wanted to attack that one first in its very own quick guide, because I think it is the easiest route to feeling a little bit of confidence in using DNA testing in your genealogy. And that's because the Y chromosome follows the same path as your surname. So any two males with the same surname who share the same Y chromosome share a common paternal ancestor in the recent past. So I feel like you can get kind of immediate results, feel immediate success when you make a genetic connection with someone on a direct male line. So uh, the Y chromosome is just a natural place to start. Um, All of us have surnames that we're interested in. Even us as females, why we can't be tested on the Y chromosome, we can ask a brother or cousin or uncle or father to be tested to represent our line. And uh, it's just kind of an immediate success point for most people. Exactly. And you're going to love this, you guys, because when you look at this, she's got it. There's pictures, too. <laughs> and I love that because I can visualize what we're talking about. It's it's uh, definitely walks you through in text, but you can see the pictures and how these things fit together. Now, Diane, why DNA is something that probably many people who are listening right now maybe have already run. They've had that test done either with somebody in their family or themselves. Would this still be helpful? Is is there more that they could maybe go back and revisit with those results? Actually, I think that this guide is for the person who's already been tested. Uh, I think it will, one, convince you that it's okay to be tested and tell you who to get tested and how to test them. Uh, but then the bulk of the information is really for those who have had their Y-DNA tested and they don't know what to do with it. it mm-hmm. It's a complete guide to the results that you receive from your testing company. And it teaches you what's a good match. How do I know if I do share common ancestry with this person or not? What does that look like genetically? And then what are some tools that I can use to help make sense of the results and eventually find a connection with these people that I match. 
Well, I am so looking forward to um, putting this into practice myself because I already have some test results that I can work with. And it was so wonderful to know that I don't need to go and pick up a book and read an entire book in order to be able to do a little more with the results we've already done. This four-page laminated guide really does answer all the questions I had, and it helped me take the next step. I'm looking forward to the autosomal and the mitochondrial ones. So, Diane, thank you so much. We'll look forward to uh, talking to you again, and thanks so much for joining us today on the show. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. I am very excited to get to know your listeners. I feel a great passion for helping people understand what this is all about. My favorite moments are to see those light bulbs go off on people's heads where they feel like, I get this, I understand this, and I can use this. And I just can't wait to see that happen with your listeners. I'm excited for it too. Thank you so much, Diane. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 168. Now I know, I know we ran out of time. I was going to talk to you about this genealogy project I've been working on. Hang in there. I think we'll do it in our next episode. I don't want to shortchange it. And I want to share with you some of the things I've been learning. Um, some of the, the ways in which I'm using old tools to do some very cool new things. And it's just very fun. And I've been having a blast. You know, you often ask me, when do you have time to do your own family history research? I've been making time a little bit more lately, and I'm loving it. I hope that you are too. If you have uh, any questions, you want to share what you're working on, send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at the voicemail line, 925-272-4021. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.